My name is Mike Aben and welcome to my KSP campaign. I am here in simulation mode, the simulation mode that's provided by Kerbal Construction Time, trying to work out some kinks uh, in my Otter 3, which was prominently, rather prominently display, uh, on display in the last episode, um, especially towards the end of the episode where it developed, thanks to the Dang It mod, uh, a stuck Aerion, uh, which made it a little difficult to control, so I've tweaked a couple of things. I mean, really, that wasn't a fault of this particular plane, but I didn't like how that one, you know, problem created so many headaches for me getting it back to the Kerbal Space Center, so I thought I'd give it a bit of a, uh, bit of a test run here. And while I'm doing that, uh, why don't we talk about what's coming up in this particular episode. We have coming at you, uh, we're going to the return of the Karine coming back from Minmus. We're going to get it back to Kerbin Station and hopefully get that science back down to the Kerbal Space Center that it collected after its Minmus landing. We uh, have the inaugural flight of the Otter 4, another jet plane that you will be seeing very shortly. And uh, we also have the launch of Moho 1, our second interplanetary probe, which obviously is going to be on its way to Moho, but right now what I'm doing, well, one of the when this thing started having uh, control issues, I considered briefly ditching it in the water. And I know with the update to 1.05 that the uh, buoyancy model has changed, making ditching it into the water quite a bit easier. But I didn't want to do it then because I was worried how it would. I didn't, you know, I wanted to test it first. So here I am testing it, going at about a hundred meters per second horizontally. I am controlling, but I want to hit the water fairly hard. I am controlling my vertical speed, but I'm just about there. And boom, we're down. And you can see I lost the engines, but the rest of the plane survived just fine. It's floating there nicely, and that was hitting the water at about 100 meters per second. So, uh, I think I can safely start ditching planes in the water in case of emergencies from here on in. And a little later that same day, I noticed this notification here that uh, my Minmus mapping satellite contract is now complete. Excellent. So uh, that means I got should have another contract mm -hmm. opening up here. What do we got here? Position Maxwell 2 in an adjusted orbit about the moon. Maxwell 2 is already orbiting the moon. Let's see here. Engineers visiting Zoltonic Electronics felt really unsure about whether we knew very little about whether the moon wasn't actually so okay as everyone thought. Okay, you might have to give me a sec to parse that one out. <laughs> but the long and the short of it is, they want me to adjust the orbit of that satellite. That certainly sounds easy enough. Oh, Let's go man. check it out. So you can see our current orbit there in blue and our target orbit in green. They certainly don't look very different. So I'm just going to dial up the contract here. Oh, here it is. All right, we'll just get rid of this other stuff. And then we'll expand the window so that we can see what the orbital parameters are. I still have 250 meters per second left in this particular satellite. So I don't see why this would be a problem. So I'm, I'm right now the satellite's moving towards the south. So what I'm going to do is put it my maneuver node right where the planes of the two orbit crosses. Yeah, right about there. Okay, so let's take a look. Yeah, that looks about right. Oh, it's right at the descending node, of course. <laughs> so, oh, that was easy enough. They have the descending node where the two orbits cross, so that's easy to tell then where I need to put the maneuver. Okay, let's move this out of the way. Let's take a look at what we got here. So, I need my periapsis to be 404.8 kilometers, and my current periapsis is 404.8 kilometers. Wait a second. Oh, geez, the two periapsis is psi? Periapsi? <laughs> I don't know, but the two of them are pretty much the same. In fact, the orbits look to be pretty much touching there on the other side. I don't think this is the side I'm going to want to do my burn. No, I'm going to want to do my burn over on the other side here where the two orbits touch, and then I can... Uh, so if I did my burn on this side, I would have to do one burn to match inclination and then another burn to uh, get the orbit right on the other side. But here, I can probably do this all in a single burn, which whenever you can combine burns together, that's going to be the more efficient way to do it. So we're going to put our node right here. And this burn is going to be 
mostly normal to change the plane of the orbit, a little bit of prograde to push that apoapsis where it needs to be, and then a smidge of radial just to put the periapsis and apoapsis exactly where the contract wants them to be, but that certainly didn't take too long to to set up the maneuver, and it ended up costing me only 58 meters per second. So, uh, you know, uh, if you want, if, if the game wants to throw me another one of these, please do. I love these kind of contracts. So we'll just uh, time warp over to the other side, perform the burn. Okay. You see the orbits are getting pretty close, and oh, 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 the contract requirements have all just gone green. Oh, well, maneuver's not done, but what's the point now? So all we got to do now, wait 10 seconds, and then this contract is complete. And here we have Moho 1 lifting off the pad on its way. Well, where else? It's on its way to Moho, obviously. And this is going to be an orbiter. And you saw me building this thing actually uh, a few episodes ago. Uh, I showed you me building it in the vehicle assembly building and I talked a little bit at that time about the difficulty of Moho as a target. It is definitely uh, one of the more challenging bodies in the Kerbin system. Uh, a few stats about this particular payload. It is a 19 ton payload which is actually the second heaviest thing that I've put into space so far in this game. Uh, the only thing heavier being the Karayan. Uh, and it has a Delta V. The payload has a Delta V of 5,333 meters per second. So it is quite a big boy to have to lift, and that ended up having me breaking out the uh, 2.5 meter parts. Well, I've, I've done it a little bit, but this is the first time I've gone full scale with the 2.5 meter parts. So I got the big orange fuel can, I got the big hefty skipper, or not the skipper engine, the mainsail engine, that reliable mainsail engine down there on the bottom, and on the sides, have these uh, great looking radial uh, sort of Russian style radial liquid fuel boosters. Um, they're 1.875 meter parts coming from homegrown rockets. Okay, so while we watch this thing ascend, why don't we talk a little bit about the uh, Delta V requirements for going to Moho. So uh, actually I got into a discussion uh, with, with a few people about uh, Moho and how we always see whenever we go to Moho to uh, not, uh, seems to take more fuel than what the Delta V maps say. The Delta V map that I have says that my escape burn to get to Moho is about 1,710 meters per second and a capture, low orbit capture around Moho, to be 2,410 meters per second. Well, I went around and I did my own numbers after that. I figured out how to do the calculations. And, uh, I calculated an escape burn of 1,650 meters per second and then a capture burn of 2,280 meters per second. Uh, so it's pretty much right in the same ballpark. So whether you go with Delta V numbers from the map or whether you go with the de my Delta V numbers. Oh wait, we're going to get the separation of the boosters here. I'm just going to, there we go. Yes, that's my poor impersonation of the Korolev Cross. <laughs> That, that, that famous visual effect that comes off the uh, Russian rockets when they separate. Nah, mine doesn't look as good as theirs, but oh well, I'll work on that. Anyway, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, I was talking about Delta V. So whether you take my numbers or whether you take the uh, numbers from the Delta V map, you're looking in around 4,000 to 4,200 meters per second to escape Kerbin and then get a capture by at Moho. Uh, but that really should be considered a best case scenario and the reason for that is that Moho's orbit is fairly highly inclined uh, relative to Kerbin. It has an inclination of 7 degrees and that usually will require some sort of normal correction burn en route and the worst case scenario is that that correction burn could cost you up to 2,500 meters per second. That's pretty expensive. So uh, if you start thinking about that, you know, 4,200 meters per second plus 2,500 or so meters per second, you're now looking at, you know, uh, 6,700 meters per second. And I mentioned at the beginning, this thing has 5,333 5, meters per second. So if I'm into worst case scenario land, well, this uh, 
this this orbiter is going to turn into a flyby. And it can get worse than that. Uh, the most efficient place to catch Moho is at the periapsis of your transfer burn from Kerbin to Moho, right? So when you're at the opposite side of where you initiated your burn. Um, that's the most efficient place to do it. That's where your trajectory is going to match Moho's orbit as closely as it can, which will minimize the uh, cost of, of getting a capture. If you getting that capture either before or after that spot, uh, especially if it's significantly before or after periapsis, um, then the uh, capture is going to increase and may increase dramatically. So uh, you got to do the transfer pretty carefully. And if you're surprised at that 2400 meter per second plus cost of getting a capture around Moho, um, keep in mind that Moho is pretty close to the sun. Moho is about 5 million kilometers from the sun compared to Kerbin, which is about 14 million kilometers from the sun. And all that time while the probe is traveling to Moho, it's falling. It's falling that 9 million kilometers. And during that fall, it's going to be picking up quite a lot of speed. And uh, it's that speed that you're trying to really cancel out when you're trying to get that capture at Moho. So when you get to Moho, you are going to be trucking it. All right, we are in orbit. So let's take a look at the vehicle here. You can see the radiator glowing nice and red, getting rid of the heat from uh, our ascent. And it's got one deployable solar panel that I'm having some trouble clicking on for some reason. There we go. And it will orient the vessel so that the panel is pointing northwards. And this is the first time, I've had these unlocked for a while, but this is the first time uh, I've used uh, one of these ones that automatically point themselves towards the sun. You can see it going there. So if I orient it either north or south, it'll always get 100% solar exposure. So that's nice. And that single solar panel will power all the electronics on board, including all the science equipment, which does include as well a uh, ScanSat altimeter, and for the first time that multi-spectral analyzer from ScanSat, as well as the usual assortment of stock science parts. So we're going to set up our maneuver here, and we're going to be setting it up at around sunrise on the leading edge of Kerbin. And then uh, when we burn here, our trajectory is going to take us around the day side. And that will, allow, that will get us burning our, our escape in the opposite direction in which Kerbin goes around in its orbit. We'll select periapsis down there. And then we're just going to burn ourselves prograde until our uh, periapsis gets down around Moho's orbit, which you see highlighted there in yellow. And if you're a little bit surprised that a single solar panel is enough, uh, don't forget that the inverse square law is in effect in Kerbal Space Program, and Moho is about two and a half times closer to the sun than Kerbin is, and that makes it that solar panel over six times more efficient when it gets down to, uh, or it's able to generate at least six times the power when it gets down, uh, down and around Moho's orbit. So we don't need that much solar panel. And you see me do these sort of transfer burns back when I talk about doing this. I'm not going to talk about it too much other than, remember how I was mentioning that worst case scenario, you have to do a 2,500 meter per second correction burn? Well, I think I have the actual best case scenario coming up here because if you look at where my encounters are, they are very close to the ascending node of Moho's orbit. And if I can get it, in, you know, the encounter to happen there, it's taking a little bit of finagling, but I'm thinking I should be able to get an encounter without having to do any kind of correction at all. Well, that's not true. I'm sure I'll mess up the burn a little bit and have to do a little bit of a correction, but if I can get this, boom, there it is. I got my encounter, nothing but prograde. Not only nothing but prograde, but uh, it's only a burn of about 1,494 meters per second. And according to my calculations, it should have cost me about 1,650 meters per second. So, uh, you know what? Take that math. <laughs> so there we go. So that burn is coming up in almost five days. 
uh, we'll perform at that time, and then we'll uh, unset up a correction, I'm sure we will. And then we'll also uh, probably play around a little bit, see if I can figure out how much the capture is going to cost and whether I'm going to be able to get my orbit that I want. But that's going to have to be for a future episode. Because right now we're going to join the Korion, which is in the middle of its arrow breaking pass. Well, actually, to be honest, this is its second arrow breaking pass. The first pass happened during the events of last episode, but there was so much going around, going on last episode that I thought I would just cut it out and just go and talk about arrow breaking this episode. And what I want to actually draw some attention to is that heat gauge building up on the engine there on the bottom right and you might be thinking oh my gosh that's like a, that's a pretty bad thing and it's like actually no and I consider it actually a good thing it's an indication that the thermal dynamics model is actually working it should be the engines that are the most hot in the previous versions before 1.05 it was small parts like the batteries and solar panels that seem to be taking the brunt of the heating um, here it's the engines so you can see a little bit of heating happening on the those two monoprop tanks and then that's about it and the engine it's good that it's the thing getting hot because it is built to get hot that's why you go in butt in first like I'm doing here the other thing I'll mention too before we leave this is that uh, this is the first time uh, the Korion has dropped from as far a height as high a height as uh, Minmus it's never dropped this far before so it has hit the atmosphere at a higher speed than it's ever had before so I sort of dialed it back as far as the air braking goes and keeping my max G's in around 0.12. Uh, remember that a massive vessel like this uh, will not slow down as quickly as it goes through the atmosphere and that means it'll have more speed and that means it'll build up more heat. So the more massive your vessel is, the the more calm you want to take the aero braking and take your time with it. And it actually took me a couple of more passes like this one. Um, before I was able to get down to an orbit from which I could make a rendezvous attempt with the space station. But that will be in just a little bit. Right now, I have a plane that's ready to fly. This here is the Otter 4, uh, taking off rather unusually for me at night. Um, but its destination is in the daylight, so we're going to be flying into the sunrise. So. Uh, we will not be at night for very long. Besides, this gets to show off these nice cabin lights. And by the way, this is the whole reason why I built this thing is because I wanted to take advantage of this new sort of 1.25 meter uh, inline crew cabin that uh, has been added with the recent update. And also the new um, Weasley jet engine as well with its reverse thrust mode, which I have attached to the uh, RCS action group so I can push R to take on some reverse thrust and you can see along we got three Kerbals my first plane with three Kerbals I can carry three Kerbals I got Svetlana and Glafia and our scientist Luya and uh, you know, some people might accuse this thing of being a little bit ugly I suppose it is kind of ugly well its mom thinks it's cute anyway uh, why don't we take a look at the interior here there we have Luya sitting across from Glafia. Little table in between. Play some cards on the way out to the mission site. Uh, pretty ugly view of the wing out the window. Well, speaking of the mission site, by the way, uh, what we're doing the mission is to actually complete that mission that I had to abort at the end of last episode to do some seismic scanning over at some waypoints that we are on our way over to. We've already selected the waypoint. This might be a more suitable vessel than the Otter 3 that you saw last episode anyway for these kinds of missions. I mean, it's cruising along here at about Mach 0.9 at 3 quarters thrust. It's been flying for about 24 minutes and still has more than an hour of fuel left, so it has a decent range. It doesn't quite have the range or the altitude that the uh, Otter 3 can reach, but... Uh, it's not really actually that bad as far as range goes. I mean, uh, this waypoint's about 700 kilometers from the Kerbal Space Center, which is only a little bit less than the distance that the Otter 3 flew last episode. And this still will have enough fuel to get itself back home again, so uh, everything should be fine. So, as you can see here, we are approaching our first waypoint, and it seems to be in this sort of ring-shaped valley that I need to get into, and I'm looking... I think I can get in to the right there. To the right there, it seems that the hills 
are a little bit lower. So what I'm going to do is uh, turn this puppy around and then I'll come in nice and low and uh, land here where the hills don't seem to be quite so severe. Okay, so we're still several kilometers away from the waypoint, but that's okay, we can drive there. Um, and you can see we're going over 100 meters, well over 100 meters per second, but that's okay because I'm going to use the reverse thrust. So I've hit RCS to put on the reverse thrusters, and now I'm throttling up, but I'm throttling backwards, just killing my speed. This is what makes this plane actually more suitable than the Otter 3 for landing in short terrain. Like, it's lighter. Well, we'll cut that. We've gone slow enough now. There we go. Put it back into forward thrust. We should be able to just land now. Oh, I could have put myself a lot closer to the waypoint. Yeah, this thing's pretty good for, I think it's going to be pretty good for landing in short terrain because of that reverse thrust engine and also because it's much lighter. So it'll be able to brake and stop much more quickly than the Otter 3 does. Now we're coming in nice and slow and controlled and plunk. We are down. Yeah, I, I was being a little bit cautious because this is the first time I've landed this thing anywhere other than on a runway. Uh, so next time for sure, if I have a mission like this, I'm going to be getting myself closer to the waypoint and then, uh, then dropping it down with help from that reverse thrust engine. But anyway, it didn't take too long to get to the waypoint, though you can see it was kind of up this hill here. And as you can also see, I've made visible the other two waypoints that I have to get to, and they're even further up the hill. There's no way I'm going to be trying to land in there, so I'm just going to be driving this thing to each of the waypoints. But, oh, oh, we are here. Okay, we'll just have to do a seismic scan. There we go, and we'll keep that, of course. Now, we have to do seismic scans at each of those, and in order to do that, we're going to have to get Luya out there to collect the data from that seismic scanner to free it up, so we'll EVA her and... Okay, where is she? Oh, well, she can do, do an EVA report, but where is she? Uh, this is... I don't like the way this is bouncing. Board? Or, oh, oh, there's her head! Oh my gosh! Okay. <laughs> Oh, that, that, uh, I don't like that. Okay, uh, no more EVAing straight out of the crew cabin. All EVAs must now go through the cockpit. So, I still gotta grab that seismic data, and let's, come on, climb up. Up, oh, up, oh, oh, she fell. <laughs> okay, okay, is she, where is she? There she is, she's okay. Alrighty, so, uh, we're gonna have to get the ladder down. Thankfully uh, people are still in the plane to descend the ladder for her. Oh, we got the contract window in the way. Who that? Come on. There, we, there it goes. Oh, it was auto-saving at the time. That's why. Okay. Let's descend the ladder. There we go. And then we'll also get Svetlana out. Because Luya is going to have to go back in first, so she can go through the cockpit and then go into the crew cabin. So Svetlana will get out of the way. Luya will get up. Okay, climb out. Oh, oh, grab. Okay, climb. Let's try climbing out and then going left. There we go. And now we'll grab that ladder. There we go, Luya. Climb up. You can do it. There we go. And up the top. And then we can get the seismic data, yay! <laughs> took a while. Also have a pressure scan here, we can take that. I took. I just didn't show taking that, I took that a little earlier. Okay, let's get back over there, grab, and board. And then we'll transfer her. Oh, the camera's acting a little weird, it's bugging me. Okay, let's transfer her over to the crew cabin. So now Svetlana can get in. So we'll switch to Svetlana. All right, grab and board. All right, everything is good. So we'll retract the ladder and we'll just drive on over to the next waypoint. The next one wasn't any issue grabbing at all. Uh, the one after that, well, a little bit of a hill climb, but this thing 
proved itself quite capable as an all-terrain vehicle. And there we go. And with that final seismic scan collected, I just pointed the vessel downhill. And the ground very quickly flattened itself out, so I decided, well not flattened out, but more kind of just became less bumpy, still going downhill, but I just hit the throttle anyway, pitched up in the air, and flew back to the Kerbal Space Center without any issues. So why don't we get ourselves back to the Korion. In the midst of its sixth and final air braking pass, yeah, I really took my time with this one. Um, each time allowing myself to dip a little bit deeper into the atmosphere, watching the G-forces with this final pass, I had the G-forces max out at about 0.17. And that all seemed to work pretty well. Uh, one thing I did learn, I mentioned, you might remember from my aero braking adventures before, I was speculating on one, on whether KSP models body lift. I've now come to the conclusion that it does not. <laughs> it completely doesn't. Um, certainly turning yourself perpendicular to your trajectory does increase the drag, which allows you to bring your... Uh, apoapsis down even further, though you certainly wouldn't want to do this in the thicker part of the atmosphere. Um, but uh, body lift, no it doesn't. And I could tell it doesn't because I started experimenting with affecting my inclination by tilting north or south and I couldn't. So body lift, not part of the equation. The actual orientation of the craft doesn't really matter as far as lift goes. Lift only seems to be on what are designated as lifting, official lifting surfaces. But anyway, at the end of this, got my apoapsis down to 270 kilometers. Uh, pushed my per got back out to apoapsis, pushed my periapsis out of the atmosphere. You've seen this routine before. Set myself up a maneuver to rendezvous with the station. And not too long afterwards, Val and Bob and Bartner could see the finish line of their 22-day mission. Though... So, the station has changed a little bit since, thanks to the efforts of Bill adding this docking notice. The first time the Crying has been back to see the dock uh, and dock with its new berth here. Yeah, we did keep Bill busy, didn't we, while these guys were gone? Just about there. Ah! Oh, I gotta stop having the camera in chase mode when I do these dockings. It always ends up doing that, but. There we are. Nice. And of course, uh, we got to get our science back down to the surface. So Bob and Val, if you recall, are actually going to be level two if I get them back down. So they are the two that are going to go down and bring that science along with them. And we are closing in on the end of this particular episode, so I don't want to belabor on things too much. But... One thing I noticed that was kind of cool once all the re-entry effects were done was uh, the capsule is now black. Now at first I thought, did something go wrong with the texture? Because it was like black, black. But uh, upon looking upon this a little more closely, I could see the texture still there under there. It's just, uh, it's been colored black, which I have to assume is they're modeling charring on the capsule, which I think is a really, really cool idea. I just wish it just didn't look like the texture just disappeared outright. So maybe this is something they'll continue to work on, but I, I, I like it as a concept anyway. Anyway, upon recovery of the capsule, I was rewarded with 1,658 science. Now, it should be noted, I am being deducted 414.5 science due to my strategy that's converting science into reputation, but that's okay. It still leaves me with 1,772 science. That's a lot of tech nodes. It's going to be like Christmas, and it's going to have to wait until the beginning of the next episode. I hope to see you then.